Welcome to the Anxiety at Work podcast. I'm Chester Elton, and this is my co-author and dear friend, Adrian Gostick. We hope that the time you're going to spend with us will help remove the stigma of anxiety and mental health in the workplace and your personal life. And we invite experts from the world of work and life to give us ideas and most importantly, tools to deal with anxiety in our world. And our guest today is our new friend, David Plink. David is CEO of the Top Employers Institute in Amsterdam. David is an experienced CEO with 25 years of experience in general, commercial, and change management in global results-driven companies in the HR space. We are delighted to have David on our podcast. Welcome, Dave. Thank you so much. I'm uh, very delighted to be part of the podcast and uh, yeah, very excited to, uh, to have received the invitation. Well, David is joining us, as Chester mentioned, from Amsterdam today, and, and his company is all about improving the employee employee experience. So, David, a lot of that is about that you work with is better managing change. And I think you say, look, leaders like us, we do a lot to create anxiety in our teams about change. So how can leaders better improve the change process? Because every organization is going through change. Yes, indeed. Everyone is going through change, and that's kind of the constant in our day and age. So one of the things that we uh, that we observe from our vantage point, we look at top employers around the world and we survey them based on the conditions they create for their people. So often that involves implementing new policies, implementing new procedures and effectuating the overall strategic updates to those companies. And what we see is kind of a subset of really, really good companies. So luckily, we see a lot of things that are going well at these companies when it comes to change and avoiding anxiety. But a few of the pitfalls that they're trying to avoid is um, are around communications mostly. So infrequent communication, unclear communications, and also just kind of beating around the bush. When you have a message to tell that is not positive, just do it rather than circumventing it and sugarcoating it. So that's something that we often see um, in other companies as well, indirect communications, um, and particularly something we'll touch upon as well is is the lack of employee involvement in change processes. So these are things that we that we observe in the wider world around us. Lots to improve. Still. Yeah, you know that, that's a great segue into, into my question actually, because you say that talented employees want a voice in strategic decisions that are normally left to the leaders. You know, we're going to make the decisions, then you have to deliver on that promise. So walk us through this idea of how we can be more inclusive in idea generation in our teams and make it safer for people to bring those ideas to leadership. Well, I think one of the first steps is to recognize that people within the, in the trenches that actually are in, in daily conversation with clients or patients or partners or whoever they're in touch with, these are the people that have often the best ideas. They connect with the market. They connect with their peers. So I think the first thing to do is acknowledge that the best ideas come from employees. Um, that's what the co- company is founded on. And the thing is, it also engages people. When they're heard, when their ideas come to life in, in, in real strategy, the chances that that'll be absorbed and adopted is much higher. And we see some great examples from the from the community of top employers. Um, you have companies like PepsiCo and SAP and, and Puma and Adidas. These type of companies are leading the way when it comes to including the voice of their employees. And just two examples um, that we see, particularly in the in the DEI space, is that um, th- these are strategic topics for many employers. And we see that 75% of top employers currently seek employee, employee input into their ethical standards, into their diver, diversity policies, into their inclusive, inclusiveness policies. And that is compared to about 55% two years ago. So you see that the employee input in these strategic topics that determine the course of the company, that determine the attractiveness of the company as an employer are definitely guided by employees. But a lot of, you know, pushback, David, because sometimes managers will say, yeah, but if I listen to my employees, I don't use their ideas. They're just going to get all upset. It's more hassle <laughs> than it's worth. Right. So how do you how do you overcome that reluctance? 
And, and by the way, David, what he's describing is when I give Adrian a good idea, his reaction to my idea. <laughs> well, I, I, I think one of the things that, um, um, that you mentioned is the, that reluctance because managers sometimes tend to think their, the best ideas come from them. Um, what, what helps in there is kind of have an early feedback loop. So to make sure that you touch ideas off um, uh, of employees at an early stage and solicit their ideas at an early stage, because then you're still kind of in the brainstorming phase. And it's much easier to say, well, let's accept all ideas as equally valuable and then shift, sift through them. But if you, if you come up with ideas as management, um, introduce them, and then at some point, employees will come up with all kinds of ideas, it may be too late. It may be you're too far in the decision-making process. So read the early feedback loop. That's something um, that we see happening at, um, at many of our clients. And also increasing the frequency of the contact with employees. So ensuring that this is not a one-off, like there's a town hall every quarter, and then you can raise your hand. So make sure that it happens, that conversation happens on a much more frequent basis, because that helps people to give a voice. And also, yeah, in line with what we, uh, what we started out with, reducing that anxiety, making sure that people get the opportunity to be heard and not just every now and again, because then the, the hurdle to speak up is so much higher. Oh, I love that idea. You know, frequency, you know, do this early. That does mitigate a lot of those, uh, you know, concerns that some of our clients sometimes will fire at us. So one of the things that we're hearing a lot is, you know, people are heading back into the office. Maybe there's hybrid work. They're trying to figure that out. Now, you argue that managers need to tailor their working environment to the business needs, which, uh, gee, we should have been doing all along, right? Um, and the surveys find that employees, what, you know, what works best for me may, may limit the potential, though, of the business as a whole. So help us understand this issue of what's new and what's the new normal in workplaces and maybe what's the solution here? That's interesting how you, um, how you kind of fit the two against each other. So the personal needs from employees compared to the, um, the business needs, because essentially the business needs should be aligned with what employees want. Because if you do not have engaged, involved employees in the first place, you don't have to care about your business needs because there, there are none. So I think what we need to, to also kind of reframe is first to look at the employee as the starting point, rather than as the, the kind of the annoying input more as a starting point think, okay, what do my employees need? Um, this is something that we implemented our, at our company as well, where we said, okay, in determining where you work, we look at the employee as the starting point. So personal preferences, personal circumstances, um, commuting distance, all these factor into a personal preference. And then that person takes that up with their team and their manager and think, okay, as a team, how would we like to co cooperate? And if a meeting every two weeks is enough for that team, then those team members that want to be in the office every day can be in the office every day. But those team members that feel once every two weeks is enough, that's also fine. So um, it needs to kind of fit in within the team. And then above that, you have company and client perspective. So we look at what is important for the company and does the personal preference, the team preference, fit within that. So I think it's kind of turning it around, starting with the employee rather than with the business needs. Um, and obviously, if you work in hospitality, if you have a restaurant, if you have um, a factory, yes, this discussion is completely different. So we, we are talking more about firms that have the ability to, to have that flexibility. I, I really like that idea of the employee first. Because that's completely 180 degrees from traditional, right? Here's the role. Fit yourself into the role as opposed to here's who you are. We've got a great role for you, right? So you talk about, you know, making it safe for ideas and so on. We obviously our podcast is called Anxiety at Work. So what's the role of mental illness? Uh, mental <laughs> Hellness? That's not a good way to express that, Adrian. Mental wellness. What is the role of we mental We talked wellness? about editing before, David, and yeah, there will <laughs> yeah. be some editing. <laughs> we, we, we may want to edit that one out, yeah. Um, and mental fitness in the new world of HR. You know, there's a lot of talk about psychological safety. Adrian and I talk about emotional safety. So uh, what are you doing to help remove that stigma around just even talking about wellness and mental health and anxiety? 
Yeah, I think it's a very important trend that we've seen happen. Um, I've been with this company for 14 years now. We've seen that real shift from initially focused on kind of workplace, workplace health and safety, just the kind of the basics, making sure that people have a safe working environment um, with healthy ventilation and all that, moving toward like, more like physical health. So you're entering more in the domain of people personally, where you say there are gym subscriptions or uh, smoking cessation programs, all kinds of things that are more focused on having a healthy employee in um, in the workplace. And now you see there's more focus on the holistic well-being, including um, psychological health, mental health, emotional well-being, physical health, everything all together encompassed in that overall yeah, feeling of well-being. And what we see is um, an overwhelming a uh, number of top employers really focusing on adding channels where people can express concerns, where they can actually speak up in a safe environment, be it confidential, be it within teams. We see lots of training for managers to pick up on elements that require a little bit more attention. So particularly now, we're, we're kind of used to it now, two, two and a half years into the pandemic and working mostly on screen. But this is this is also a skill set. If you if you ask many how, how are you doing, the first answer is probably yeah I'm fine. But then you need to go beyond that, and for that you need managers to be trained well to ask the right questions, to pick up on signals, because they may not be as visible as they are um, in the physical workplace. Um, and another thing that is very very important is to lead by example, to basically create a culture by leaders that say it is okay not to be okay. You, you will not be okay every day. That's kind of who we are as humans. Sometimes you have a better day than other days. But if the majority of days are not so good, then you need to speak up. And it's okay to do that. Um, and we also see examples where leaders themselves do that and say, hey, I'm not necessarily happy where I'm at right now. Um, and I'm sharing that with you. Um, I remember an example in a, uh, we have these all hearts meetings in our company where we kind of just pour our heart in, and then just, casually connect. And I, I remember a time when this was in full lockdown, I w went on onto this rant where I had a big discussion with a couple of people in the supermarket, not wearing a mask. Um, and it was so frustrating because my kids were staying at home or a whole company was staying at home and the world at large was just doing all these things to not be exposed to the virus by wearing safety precautions. And these people were just ignoring that. And I was really frustrated. And I heard back and I, I shared that within this uh, old company meeting. And um, and I, I, re I heard back later that that was so much appreciated, but it showed, because it showed we're all human. You can have your frustrations and, and don't hold back on them and not in, in, in any position, but definitely not leaders. They, you want to have a certain kind of self-composure and all that. But at the same time, if something's bothering you, just speak up um, because we all want to and we all need to. So I think that's the combinations of opening enough channels, making sure that managers are well-trained to pick up on signals, um, and then for leaders to, to lead by example and showing their insecurities and frustrations as well. I've got a quick question on the training. So is this really formal training? Is it informal training? I mean, do you have, have you got... Have you got to get certified? Uh, talk to me a little bit about that because, you know, we often say, oh, we're going to train our managers up. And they go, oh, is there an organization that does that? Did you create your own? I'm just curious. Well, I guess for us, we, we have a, a leadership development program within our company that we co-developed with a partner. Um, okay. If you look at the wide range of all the companies that we annually look at and survey, um, they have often, these are larger companies. So most of the companies that we certify um, are, employ thousands of people per country. So um, they typically have self-developed or co-developed training programs that make sense for them. But there's also a range of options out there where smaller companies can benefit from subscription models and and have all kinds of management training at their disposal, even though they may not have the ability to develop it themselves. Thank you. So, so tell us, uh, while we're talking about Top Employers Institute, tell us a little bit more and how people can learn more about uh, the Institute and, and what you do there, David. Yeah, good question. Um, and sometimes I think that everybody knows that, but that's may, may not be the case. We're not that big of a company, but although we have 
why it's an impact in the world of work. Because what we do, we certify companies based on the conditions they create for their people. And um, currently we have almost 1,900 companies that are in our certification program globally. And together they employ over 8 million people that are positively impacted by the work we're doing. So um, essentially what we look at in our certification process is um, a combination of all kinds of policies that are focused on developing people. So it ranges from onboarding to performance management to, um, to well-being policies, to learning and development, leadership development, um, content then, um, everything that has to do with development of people. Um, and that's a, that's a formal audit that takes place. Um, companies can, uh, can get certified. Um, for more information, you can be best w visit our website, so www.top-employers.com. Um, so the, the, the full detail is there, but the, uh, the general gist of it is that we, we focused on um, yeah, helping large multinational companies bring out the best in their people um, and support them with our certification program. That's great. So, okay. So you do all this certification. So I want you to brag about your company because clearly you can't be doing all these certifications and giving all these recommendations and have a toxic culture. So talk a little bit about what you're doing with, you know, DE and I and, and engaging your companies and, and all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, I think um, uh, we're, we're not nearly as large as the companies that we certify. So we, we fall within a different category, but I do believe that we are inspired by our clients to, to take what we do in HR to the next level as well. And I think the example I just mentioned on the way we look at hybrid work is, is one of them, but also elements within using the employee voice. So when we launch new initiatives, when we look at things like an org design update that we did last year or product innovation, developing our own employer brand, we typically tap into our wider employee base. Um, and people are, are very enthusiastic to play a part there. So I think in, in terms of yeah, using our employee voice um, for the advancement of our company, that's something we, we do a lot. And I think in terms of DEI, and i um, one of the things that um, I've been a strong advocate for over the past years is to really make sure that we represent our company well through our leadership um, and that's something that we that we made quite a big change in over the past years so in, back in 2017 we were kind of on the cusp of a new growth wave and we had a small board like three people three guys um three northern european guys and <laughs> um and at the time we we started expanding our leadership team and i'm super proud to say right now we are a team of seven um, four women, three men, so we completely flipped it, five nationalities, um, so really a different perspective on, on the way we work. Um, I think we're much more, uh, yeah, representative of our larger employee base, where uh, just over half of the people are, um, uh, are women, um, a bit under that, uh, men. So I think it's more indicative of who we are. And also in terms of the nationality mix, um, we have 150 people almost um, working for us right now. Um, and together they represent 30 countries. So we need that mix. So both from a gender perspective as well as from a diversity perspective in all kinds of ways, um, I think we're leading the way um, with, with, yeah, with good steps for a uh, mid-sized company as ours. Oh, that's great. Okay, so, but you're a busy CEO, 150 people in your care. There's a lot of demands on your time. So walk us through how you keep your holistic health uh, healthy, <laughs> David. Tell us what, what your rituals are. Well, um, one of the rituals is something that I picked up from a, a book and an exercise I did a few months ago, which is called Hell Week. Um, and Hell Week is um, uh, what they use in the Marines um, uh, to get you on board. It. Um, and there's also kind of a, a corporate version of that. So without laying in a mud for days and, uh, and not being uh, <laughs> able to have a shower or enough food, there's a corporate version. This is uh, written by a, uh, a Norwegian uh, personal coach. And I, I went through that program. And one of the things that I picked up from it is getting up every morning at 530, which really helps my health. I do some exercises um, before six. I, um, and then I have a full hour, hour and a half that I can dedicate to the things that I need to do. But in a typical work day, kind of push towards the end and then you think, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. And that's something that, that really helps helps me to be productive throughout the day. So having that first hour and a half, two hours in solitude um, and 
and getting things done that I want to get done, like physical exercise and um, and kind of the, 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 the big annoying thing that you need to do. And another thing that I do um, uh, during the day is walk my dog. Um, also very vocal about that towards my colleagues and show it's perfectly fine on a Monday morning at 11 o'clock to go for a dog walk because it keeps you fresh. It keeps you exercised. It's just one of the things that is, um, yeah, it's a total game changer for me. You know, it's interesting. I go for a dog walk and I don't even own a dog. <laughs> yeah. I, just go for, I just go for the walk. Hey, uh, delightful discussion. Thank you so much, David, for sharing your time and your knowledge. If there were one or two things that you wanted people to take away from the discussion, what would those be? Well, especially for leaders listening to this and uh, thinking about anxiety in the workplace and, and think about how they can influence that is, is when designing policies, always look at yourself kind of on the receiving end as well, because we're all human beings. We're colleagues, we're coworkers, we're parents, we're children. We, we are all the same things that our intended audience are. Um, so really putting yourself in the position and think, okay, if this policy is going to be unleashed on me, what does it do to me? And how would I like to be um, addressed when that is introduced? And, and do I feel recognized? Do I feel heard? So always start but with, with development of new policies, implementation, and by, by looking at it, what would it do to me if I would um, receive that? And the other thing... Um, um, especially looking at anxiety, we live in a complex world. Um, the, the world is ravaged by, by war, by pandemics, by all kinds of uncertain things. Um, and one of the things that we also need to be aware of, just sometimes kick back and uh, don't take ourselves too serious. Um, it's just work. Come on. Let's, um, yeah. there's, there's more important things in life as well. So take a break. Let me add one more thing to that, and that is that you should look up Top Employers Institute and uh, get David to certify your company. I would add that as the, the other takeaway. David, this has thank been delightful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Well, Chester, you know, really delightful to, to, you know, to meet with the CEO in the HR space who is really practical advice, right? So, so tell me what you took away, first and foremost. Yeah, well, listen, first, I just want to say, you know, everybody kind of gets the why. You know, we all understand the why. What I love about what David did is he gave us tons of how. You know, how do you do it? And, and I love this about where does it break down? We said, what is it? And he said, infrequent and vague communication. Like if you're going to have town hall meetings, make sure you have them every time. Uh, if you have bad news, just tell people, <laughs> you know, it, yep. don't don't try to sugarcoat it. I, I love that he started with yeah. where the breakdown happens is it's not clear and concise communication. Right. And what yeah, the real their focus is. And I love the sort of the really sharp focus is we get people to, you know, employees to, to contribute. And and my push to which I thought was just so insightful and uh, and 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 cutting edge <laughs> and brilliant. That, uh, yes. And brilliant. Oh, yeah. Uh, was, you know, what about the pushback of I don't want to, you know, people get upset if they don't get their voices heard. He says, first off, you know, get them involved early uh, and make it frequent. So this is not just a one time thing, you know, and, and make sure that. All ideas are thrown in there. We, we've seen this with other leaders that we've worked with where, you know, they go around, they listen, they're, they're creating new values, for instance. So they go around and they talk to their people. And at least my voice was heard. I might not, my idea might not be up there, but I know the, the leader listened to me. Right. That early feedback loop that he talked about, I thought was so insightful. By the way, you know, it's always important in your personal brand to own a word. I like to think I own gratitude. Adrian, I think your word is brilliant. I think you own the word. Yeah. Um, another takeaway for me was that the um, the employee is the starting point. That really was awakening for me. That when you're looking at the position or the role or whatever, it's not the role that is, that is the starting point. It's the employee, right? And and that really to me was so it, like it came across as this is incredible common sense. Yeah. That nobody practices, right? Right, right. Nobody yeah. I know. As yeah. you said, what's their personal preference? Fine. But what's the commuting distance? What's the, yeah. I mean, are you going into Manhattan or are you, are you in Tulsa, you know, where it's a 20-minute right. commute versus, you know, and, and also team-wise, what do we need to do? 
Um, well, how often do we need to be in here together? Uh, are there people who need to be here more versus others? And so I thought that was really important. And I, I just thought it was really insightful, too, just the, that he is seeing, as we have, this move from health and safety. I remember giving talks on health and safety 10 years ago to then physical health. You know, how do we get people going to the gym or smoking less? You know, which is it's an improvement. But now we're at this idea of holistic health. How do we mm-hmm. take care of the mind, the body? And, and that falls on everyone. We all have a role to play in that. Well, and then give them the tools. Give them the training, whether you've developed it yourself or you've seen best practices in other companies. I mean, give them the tools to, to do that and, uh, and go beyond fine. Uh, we've heard that a couple of times, haven't we? So how are you doing? Fine. Go beyond fine. Really, how are you doing? And then his personal practices, which I thought were great. I mean, he, a game changer for him was get up early. Have an hour and a half to yourself to just do that stuff that you want to do. And I love the way he said that normally gets pushed to the end of the day which means it doesn't get done. The next the day, the next day, week. And, yeah. yeah, and somebody finally goes, well, hey, where is that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I thought, you know, to, the last thing for me was this idea, you know, like when designing policies, and we all do this, every company we've ever worked with says to us, Chester, you're going to come into my company, but I need you to know we're going through a lot of change. Has right. that ever not happened? <laughs> right? <laughs> and so every company thinks they're unique and they're going through all this change. Everybody is. And he says, look, when you're designing change, uh, look at, you know, how would this impact me? If I were, you know, starting out again, uh, you know, down the ladder, how, how would I like to be addressed? How would I like to be heard? What would it do to me? I thought that was just really common sense, but something so many of us forget as, as, the, as we move up the ladder. Yeah, you are on the receiving end, too. Don't forget that. <laughs> you're on the receiving end, too. Well, listen, special thanks to our producer, Brent Klein, and to Christy Lawrence, who help us, helps us find these amazing guests. And especially to all of you who listen in that have given us, you know, 30, 45 minutes of your time, hopefully some great information and some great takeaways. Absolutely. If you like the podcast, download it, share it, and we'd also love you to join our online community, We Thrive Together Global, where we're creating a safe place to talk about anxiety and mental health at work. And of course, don't forget to pick up our book, Anxiety at Work, from Harper Business. And as you can tell, we love speaking. <laughs> and not just on podcasts, we love speaking to audiences around the world, virtually or in person, on the topics of wellness, resilience, and anxiety at work. So give us a call if you'd like to have us talk to you and your organization or at an event you're planning. More than anything, thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a great uh, great session, lots of good takeaways. And thank you, Adrian, for your, how do I say this, brilliance. Oh, that's, that's a great word, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks, everybody. Until next time, we wish you the best of mental health. Mm-hmm.